Makoto Misumi always thought that he was just a regular high school student living in modern day Japan, but one day, the moon god spirited him away to tell him a secret. He tells him that his parents were victims of Truk Kun and promised that his son will follow them and become a hero as well. The god then proceeds to send him to an alternate world without another word, and tells him that he should meet a goddess who will instruct him further. When Mako reaches the palace of the goddess, she blasts him with insults, calling him ugly, dumb-looking, and other things my crush called me when I proposed to her. She tells him that she has already found other heroes to save her world, and does not need a disgusting creature like him. So she would send him to the edge of the world with other ugly-looking monsters. Since it is her duty to give him a power, she just gives him the ability to understand and speak the languages of creatures other than humans. And with that, she tells him not to reproduce in this world and throws him out. He lands in a crater in a barren, rocky land, walks to a tall mountain for three days without food or water, and is about to faint when he hears a woman calling for help. He rushes to save her, only to find that it was a terrified pig girl wearing human clothes and a two-headed dog was trying to eat her. He dodges the attacks of the dog and confuses it with his speed before kicking it in the neck, only for it to pierce his body like a bullet, and then he realizes that he was much stronger than he thought. Mecha was shocked at his abilities and the terrified pig girl has no choice but to accept his friend request. She introduces herself as the Highland Orc Emma, who is going to be sacrificed to the invincible dragon at the top of the tall mountain. She takes him to her village and teaches him fire magic, which he masters in one go and the next morning, he heads to the tall mountain to thank Emma by taking care of the dragon. Since he was in the school archery club, he transforms fire into a bow and arrow and hits a gate with his fire arrow. Though it was just a practice shot for him, the arrow blasts the gate, and the bad guys that were harassing the orcs are instantly defeated by that attack. They were just using the dragon's name to prey on orcs, but now that Mecho has harmed the dragon's house, it appears to fight him. Red mist covers everything, and the majestic dragon comes forth and attacks Mecho, who dodges everything. The mist thickens, but our hero has a new sensory skill that allows him to see the dragon despite the mist, and he dodges all the attacks before beginning his counterattack. He then creates fireballs everywhere around the dragon and blasts her, and as she is stunned by the damage, Mako shows off his boxing skills. With just three punches, he knocks the dragon out, but as soon as he lets his guard down, the dragon uses its magic eyes to trap him in an illusion, where she thinks he would die. Mako sees his junior at the archery club, Mikumi, who is quite pretty and popular, and in his dream, she confesses to him and is being rather pushy. He knows that this is not possible since he is lacking in looks, height, brain, and even money, so he can tell that it is an illusion, and he uses his power to clear it. Now he realizes that this was the power given to him by the moon god, and using it, he could manipulate the area around him at will. He had used it to sense the dragon earlier, and now he uses it to strengthen his fists so that he can break through the illusion trap. He is outside and is ready to beat the hell out of the dragon, but she behaves like a kitten, begging for her life. The dragon comes straight to the point saying that she had seen his memories and was interested in seeing more of them. And for that reason, she wants to offer him a contract to become his companion, which would benefit both parties. Mako is initially hesitant, but he agrees to the contract and the dragon begins the ritual. Magic surrounds them, and as the dragon girl tries to craft a pact, and as the contract is completed, she transforms into a pretty woman, truly the best thing that can happen in any anime. Mako is disappointed since he was more interested in a dragon servant than a girl, and the dragon girl tells him this is why he will die a virgin. The dragon girl then explains that in a contract like this, the weaker being takes the form of the stronger one, and since she was going to become a human woman, she became a samurai because she was interested in period dramas she saw in Mako's memories. Then she takes her new master to her demi-plane, which is an imaginary world only she can access, and while she was expecting it to be dark and empty like my future, she found that it was a lush forest area that had changed according to Mako's memories. Seeing such a large area under his command, Mako thinks that this is free real estate and wants to build a city here, thinking that it would be a mystic and legendary location. Then he takes the dragon girl to the orcs to explain that she was not involved in eating them and they throw a party for their hero. There he talks with Emma and thinks that she is intelligent, kind, even pretty for orc standards, and starts wondering if she could be his heroine in the other world. She might not be a bad choice, but only if we are talking about the menu for dinner and not about a girlfriend. Meanwhile, Dragon Girl suggests to the village chief that they move to a better place, and the next morning, all of them have packed their bags to move into her demi-plane and become the first residents of Mako's dream city. He tries to convince them otherwise, but the orcs are determined, and then Dragon Girl absorbs all of them with their houses and shops into her plane with mist gates. In a week's time, the orcs have made some progress in building the city, and Mako has also mastered various magic elements, out of which he finds that he is the best at water and can't use wind at all. 
Outside, the orcs are having some problems cutting the hard trees and Mako helps him using the power he got from the moon god, which he has now named Kai. He creates his own around him and inside that, he strengthens his knife and slashes the tree like it was butter, before lifting it and dropping it in one corner. He can even use Kai to heal the injuries of the orcs and that trick does not even need magic, but he cannot do that to himself. Then the driving girl returns from an errand, and she is holding an unconscious dwarf man in her arms, and she tells her master that the dwarf was injured by the Black Spider of Disaster, a monster with eternal hunger. Just as she says that, a giant spider breaks the invisible wall protecting this imaginary world and tries to enter it. If Trump was there, he would have built a stronger wall. The giant spider monster comes into the demi-plane, the dark aura and killing intent it is leaking terrifies Mako, and on top of that, the dragon girl refuses to help him. But she tells him that she has fought it before and that the spider will run away after a little damage. So our hero uses Kai and blocks the first round of the spider's attack before launching his counterattack and slicing one of its legs. But before he can attack a second time, the spider jumps above him and tries to trap him in its dark web. Mako cuts the dark web only to find that the spider has regenerated the leg he just cut, and no matter how much he attacks it, it keeps on regenerating. So he changes his strategy and uses his fire magic and archery skills to score a headshot on the spider. After that, he turns a powerful fireball into a spear and lands a big blow on the monster, who is still coming after him. It absorbs the magic residue from Mecho's attack and heals itself, so he has to change his attack pattern again. He creates many fire spears and launches a volley that pierces the spider, but he hears a feminine laugh from the spider that is completely healed and attacks the tired Mako, breaking his Kai barrier and stabbing him with the giant arms. Mako was holding it back until now so that he did not destroy his developing city, but now he is furious and creates a huge explosion that sends the spider flying with holes in its guts. Then he creates a machine gun of his fireballs that keeps the spider down while he takes his time to prepare his ultimate attack. Using his best element, water, he creates a powerful water arrow and shoots the spider, piercing it, in the forest. But that is all he could do and collapses because he used too much magic. Unfortunately, the spider is not yet dead, and it is healed enough to capture Mako alive, and the dragon girl fears that she cannot save her master from being eaten. But the spider turns out to be a real pervert who really likes pain and being dominated, and fighting Mako was the first time she felt so full after such a long time, so she enjoyed every bit of it. She wants to be together with him every moment of her life, but the dragon girl punches it and frees Mako before giving the spider a suggestion. She asks him to form a servant contract with him right now even though he was unconscious, and they could get his permission later. The spider agrees to form the contract, and when Mako wakes up later completely healed, he finds a girl dressed in black next to him who thanks him for the meal and promises to devote herself to him. He is shocked and terrified, and even though the girl is a little cute, he does not get a good feeling from her. The girl in black tells Mako that he was healed by the dragon girl, her tiny clone, and Emma, but he has only asked her who she is. She replies that she is the black spider and tells him everything about how she formed a contract with him when he was unconscious, and as she licks her lips, saying that she offers everything to her master, our hero is terrified that she will steal his virginity. When the dragon girl comes, he is frustrated at her and sarcastically calls her a great servant, but dragons don't understand sarcasm, so she is pleased, thinking that he meant it. She then introduces the elder dwarf she saved the other day. He was from an ancient subline of the dwarfs that created many legendary weapons and items, and even though the dragon girl hypes him, he is quite humble when thanking Mako for saving him. He has another request for him, and he wants his village to be absorbed into the demi plane. Mako is quite easygoing and accepts his request quickly. But the dragon girl covers for his innocence and says that the dwarves will have to fulfill some conditions, like helping in the city's development and creating weapons. The elder dwarf has no problems with that and says that he will convince his clan in a few days, but with the help of her scales, the dragon girl bribes him to get it done quicker and Mako can just stare at the corruption of his underlings. After that, the servants have a request for Mako. They want him to name them and even though he thinks it is nothing special, they are quite passionate and won't accept lazy naming. Mako thinks hard to come up with a beautiful name, and after putting his brain through an intense exercise, he names the dragon girl Tomo, after the bravest female samurai in history. She is really pleased by her name and dances as she starts to glow. Then she explains that being named by the master increases the strength of a monster, and I think the exact same thing happened in another anime on our channel. Tomo says that there was a particular name that could bring out the most of her strength, but rather than that, she just wants an organic name for her master. Next up is the spider and Mako names her Mio, and that name makes her too happy and obedient. 
The next day, Mako finds a huge crowd of different species that include orcs, dwarves, spider people, and lizard people in his city, and he is shocked because he had never seen the last two species before. But before he can ask his servants, they introduce themselves to the crowd and then conduct democratic elections to decide the title of their master and officially settle on calling him Young Lord and seeing how eager the orcs are, he cannot refuse them. Then the chief of the dwarves comes to greet Mako and says that he looks barely human and he feels offended. But then the chief says that unless he was sent by the goddess, it was impossible for him to control such a powerful servant and sours his mood even more. Mako is angry and lashes out, but the chief is relieved to see he is not with the goddess because they do not like her anyway, and thus he decides to serve him. Then Tomo introduces the lizard people as her followers, who were good at using water and wind magic, and they are all Mako's servants now. After her, Mayo introduces her spider people called Alk, who shared her curse of always being hungry. But as soon as she drank Mako's blood, their curse was broken along with her. All the Alks have powerful regeneration, and they are partially perverts like their boss. But Mako is uncomfortable with too many demi-humans around him, and now he desperately needs to meet some humans. Luckily, he finds a human village nearby and sees a pretty blonde woman outside it. But as soon as he approaches her, she is terrified and runs away, calling him a monster. Mako is shocked and wonders what was happening and he is in denial, thinking that the girl must have seen something crazy. But as he reaches the entrance of the town, he finds that humans have geared up for battle. He is polite and asks them if he wants to enter the town, but they don't understand his language and shoot him, sure that he is a monster. Mako runs with a kite barrier that deflects their arrows and he realizes that the goddess told him he could speak languages other than humans and she deliberately made him unable to communicate with humans. He goes home and cries to the three girls in his life, who tell him that every creature can speak human in this world apart from him. And then Emma tells Mako that people are not afraid because of his language and Tomo jokes, saying it was because of his ugly face and gets a good smack. The truth is Mako has a tremendous amount of magic that leaks out as a terrifying aura equal to 10 demon kings, and that scares the humans. Emma teaches him to control it, but there is very little progress and since Mako is not going to give up on meeting humans, he searches for other methods to control his aura. He is fired up to learn their language, get a mask to hide his face, and get a tool to suppress his magic. But the tasks are too difficult, as the human language is as difficult as Chinese, and the ring that the dwarf artisan brings to absorb his magic breaks almost instantly. Working on both of these things gradually, Mako has learned the human language sufficiently and decides to write it using magic since he has problems with pronunciation. And the dwarf master has created a ring that can efficiently suppress his magic. With that, Mako sets out to the nearby town, posing as a rich merchant's son, and his two servants act as guards. In the town, he thinks everyone is handsome, and to his servants, they look just average-looking. And now he realizes why the goddess mocked him. They reach the Adventurer Guild, where they explain the ring, the mask, and Mako's inability to speak as a curse, and the receptionist explains the normal guild business of how they can increase the rank from E to SSS by completing jobs. Mako also learns that he will have to get a merchant guild card made, which can only be done in a distant city. He then checks out the jobs posted there and finds that the ace of this guild was over level 400, and the same is true about his two servants. But the small measuring scrolls are not enough for them and they need something larger and thicker, so the staff brings out the big scrolls that can measure levels up to 1600. Tomo is barely over 1300 while Mayo is at 1500, and the former is quite jealous about it. As everyone is still in disbelief, Tomo talks to the receptionist about the strongest adventurer in the country and learns about a level 900 woman called Sophia Bolga, who was called the Dragon Slayer after killing a dragon named Lancer. Tomo knows the dragon and does not like the Dragon Slayer, her natural enemy. But that Mako checks out his level in the guild and finds that he was just level 1 and the entire guild laughs at him. Then he books a room in an inn for the night, and the manager charges extra until Tomo threatens to trash his inn if he does not reduce costs. But everything else in the town is also too costly, and the dragon girl thinks that it is a fishy situation that will lead to an exciting adventure. Mako says that they are being followed, and he leaves the samurai wanted behind as he takes Mio on a dinner date, and on the way back, they meet a poor girl. The girl wants to say something, but she is hesitant, and Mako asks Mio to handle her. He expected her to be delicate and kind to the girl, but she scares her, and Mako smacks her, telling her this is not how one talks to children. Then he talks to the girl, who says that she has a request, and even before she says what she wants, she cries and hugs Mako, emotionally manipulating him to take her in. One adventurer is watching the act from a dark corner, and he is happy that the little girl is doing her job well. In the hotel room, the girl introduces herself as Rin and says that first her father left to get milk and never returned, and then her sister went to earn bread, and she also did not return. 
And now that she is alone and broke, she wants Mako's help. Meanwhile, Tomo is guiding the carriage with their goods when armed thieves attack her, but they are too slow and weak as compared to her. She easily dodges their attacks, and it takes only one kick for her to break all the bones in their chest. Then she slices two of them with one swing of her sword, captures the last one to interrogate, and takes her to the hotel room, where Mako scolds her for needlessly killing three people. Then he sees the sketch of Rin's sister Toe that the little girl made, and Mako is uneasy from the moment he sees it. She looked exactly like his crush, Nukimi, and that is why he checks the memory of the captive woman and finds that her gang had kidnapped Toe. He orders Mayo and Tomo to find her immediately, and they wonder why their master is so impatient. The girls are out all night trying to be detectives, and the next day Mako takes Rin along with him as he sells the fruit from the demiplane in the market for 500 gold coins. As they return, the poor girl can only think about her sister vanishing and leaving her alone to fend off the lone sharks. But then she sees someone and runs towards him, telling Mako that she was just going home for a bit. But he is sharp enough to notice what was going on, and he uses his kai to investigate and finds that Rin was reporting to an adventurer who asks the girl to steal a 500 gold coins from the merchant. He threatens the little girl that if she does not do that, her sister will suffer, but if she steals the amount, both of them will be forever free from their debt. Rin is in a moral dilemma, but for her sister, she decides to betray the man who gave her shelter and food. Mako has hurt everything, and he thinks that those people are beyond saving, but this town badly needs a hero. Meanwhile, Tomo and Mayo have already done their job and found that Toe is alive in an underground jail. She is unwell and weak, but Mayo heals her easily and then destroys the door, asking her to come along. But they are stopped by the strongest adventurer in town, a cowboy named Mills, and then his underlings join him, who are the same guys who were controlling Rin just now. Tomo says that she understands everything. Mills was acting like a hero on the outside, but he was actually a pathetic villain and a coward. He gets angry and accuses them of faking their level. But then he changes his stance and asks them to join their team. The girls politely refuse him, but then he insults their master, calling him ugly and saying that he must have a smaller package than the average man. This makes Tomo and Mayo angry, and they punch Mills, who reveals that he was using a powerful shield spell that could block a missile. Tomo is even more excited to fight now, and with her next punch, she breaks the shield and sends Mill crashing into the wall before beating everyone down. Meanwhile, Mayo is taking care of the rest of the thugs, and in this process, she breaks the walls and frees the other adventurers being held captive there. She gets a chance to throw hands at Mills, which makes his face swollen, and he has bigger lips than a pig for a second. The vice leader of the thugs is remaining, and Tomo traps him in her illusion, and inside it, he imagines himself as a part of another kind of anime that involves tentacles. Now that the thugs are dealt with, the girls destroy the building, and as Mills uses his remaining strength to hold Toe hostage, the angry girls punch him and send him flying to the moon. Then they get into a competition about who defeated more thugs and ask Toe to be their judge as they show off their power. And as a result of their competition, they completely destroy the town as if meteorites have fallen upon it. Rin and Toe reunite, and as the latter thanks Mako, he sees that except for her hair color, she was an exact copy of his crush, even her three measurements were the same. After that, it is time to punish the two naughty girls for destroying the town, and Mako asks Mio to give him some silk so that he can tie them together, and then ties the silk rope to an arrow. He shoots them into the sky, and I'm pretty sure that is how NASA is going to send the next man to the moon. To avoid the responsibility of his servants destroying the town, Mako hides the truth from everyone and flees the town with his two girls, Rin and the adventurers he rescued on the way. They are traveling to the merchant city, and thanks to Tomo's powers, the memories of the adventurers traveling with them have been wiped out, and they think it was because of a monster rampage. At the teleportation center, Mako tries to separate Mayo and Tomo so that their jealousy does not destroy another town. He tells Tomo the stories about samurais who went rogue to grow stronger, and she likes the idea and immediately seeks his permission to go out in the wild and train. Now that her rival is gone, Mio thinks that she will have all the attention of her master, but Toe and her breasts are tough competition. The group then travels in a carriage, and on the way, Meko senses some killer bee monsters using his kai. He tells Mio to take care of it, and she uses her fan to cut the insects using her wind blade attack. Meko wants to keep moving, but Toe tells him that they need to collect items from the monsters, and Meko cannot meet her eye as he is again and again tempted to look just a little below. But, as he watches her cut the monster corpses brutally, his interest in the girl decreases. And so, by traveling and fighting monsters along the way, the group reaches the merchant town. Just as they are about to reach the gate, they find a rare type of bee monster called the Ruby Eyes. And the ordinary adventurers are not confident that they can handle them. Mako asks Mio to kill the insects, but when the adventurers ask her to not damage their precious bodies at all, 
she is frustrated and tells her master to go and do it himself. Seeing that he has no choice, Meko dons his bow and arrow and shoots the weak spot of ruby eyes and takes them down one by one. No one can believe that a level 1 merchant could be this skilled in fighting, but they are not interested in him for more than 5 seconds, as they have to go and collect the raw material from the rare monsters before entering the town. Since the previous town got destroyed before the registration news could be transferred elsewhere, Mako has to re-register and he finds that he is still level 1. But he finds an S-rank quest by a patron that he can do despite being an E-rank. The art trading company wants the ruby eyes he just hunted and Mako thinks this is the perfect chance to make some good money. So when he divides the material from the hunt with the adventurers, he takes all the ruby eyes and some other material. They decide to meet at night to party to celebrate coming here safely and making good money. Their guild cards act as mobile phones, using which they can call each other, access town maps and monster encyclopedias, and even paywall content. At night, the group enjoys eating meat and drinking alcohol, while getting to know each other better. There is an elf archer in the group, a human alchemist, and a dwarf warrior apart from Toe, who is a thief. The drunk dwarf girl challenges Mako to arm wrestling and he defeats her like she was just a child. As everyone else passes out after drinking too much, Toe warns Mako about the art trading company he is going to deal with because she has heard that bad things happen to their clients. That makes Mako overly cautious and he goes to fetch the ruby eyes before going to his room in the hotel, where Mayo is waiting for him. She is really desperate to get intimate with him and wants to destroy one of the beds to increase her chances, but Mako has no plans to indulge her fantasies and he goes straight to sleep. The next day, he goes back to the demi-plane as he can now create Mist Gates himself, and there Emma has taken on the job of his secretary, and she informs him that every species here is settling in and doing their job. And by uniting their strength, they were creating a giant castle for Mako, whose plan they learned from watching the dramas from his memory that Tomo had recorded and translated. Talking about the dragon girl, neither Mako nor Emma, and not even her tiny clone, have been able to contact her. But Mako does not have time to think about that as the chief of dwarves runs to fetch him to their workshop, where they show him the flashy armors they have created. But he refuses to wear them as he is an archer and not a combatant, and the dwarves start crying. But then Mako sees a coat that fits his style, and it is made by the same mad genius who made his ring, and he is certain that this coat will absorb enough of Mako's magic to kill him, which it obviously does not. The coat has high magic and physical defense, and it can even change color to switch from defense focus to mobility focus. But it gets torn immediately, and the mad genius dwarf is determined to make a better one next time. The Alka become humans by using temporary transformation magic, and they mainly work on ingredient collection and have no trouble picking and eating even the most poisonous things. The next day, Mako takes the ruby eyes and goes alone to the art trading company, nervous about his first big business. He is greeted warmly by the president of the company, Patrick, and his loyal butler. As Mako tells them about his fake curse story, and that he's a level 1 adventurer and plans to be a merchant, Patrick says that they have nothing more to talk about with him. The mention of being level 1 turns the merchant off, and he thinks that he is just another overconfident newbie who is doing everything wrong. But as Mako shows them the ruby eyes, the merchant is shocked to find that it was the real deal, and he apologizes to the masked man. Then he tells him that the reason he needs these rare ingredients is to create a magical cure-all medicine called Ambrosia, for his wife and two daughters who are down with a cursed disease. A wish doctor had put a level 8 curse on the three women, and even though he was tortured and later killed, he told Patrick no details about the curse. Mako is moved by his story and he gives him more eyes as he offers to help him and Patrick and his staff are so happy that they hug each other and cry. And then our hero goes to the merchant guild, where two tests stand in his way as obstacles before he can become a merchant. The receptionist there tells him that first he will have to pass a tough written test, and if he passes, he will get the practical test of material gathering, and at the end, he will have to deposit money to show that he is financially sound. To prepare for the written test, Mako buys the costly manual, and as he reads it, he regrets the decision almost immediately. Seeing the look on his face, the receptionist thinks he found the subject difficult, but Mako asks to take the test without any further preparation because it was math at grade school level. He is done with the test in five minutes, and the examiner is shocked that he got full marks. He is so shocked that he gets a small heart attack, and Mako wonders about how low the level of education is in this world. Then comes the time for the material gathering test, and the examiner is happy that Mako drew the short straw and has to gather four difficult to get items or something of equal value in three days. But Mako thinks for a while, and after some mental calculations, he puts the parts of the killer bees he hunted as something of equal value, and the examiner is shocked once again. He then goes to a restaurant and has no idea what anything tastes like, 
and when he orders something that looks like lemonade, he finds that it tastes like a banana shake. He can't digest it, and goes back to the demiplane to eat some fruits and learns from Tomo's clone that the production was low because the weather had been uneven lately. Meko talks about his dream of an illusory city with a clone, explaining that it was a city people would only find if they got lost in the mist. Here, they would receive gifts in the form of rare food items and weapons, and this would create good image of the goods outside and increase their value. And suddenly, he gets a telepathy call from Tomo, who informs him that Maya was in trouble. Mako runs to the records room to find his two servants fighting, and he asks a humanized Alk what was happening. She tries her best to explain, but it is not enough, so he breaks the fight and asks Tomo what is happening. It turns out that Mayo saw anime in Mako's memories, and now she is a self-proclaimed otaku after watching just Death Note. And now our hero has two women with different tastes in TV shows who keep on fighting about which is better. The next morning, Mako talks to the alchemist he traveled with and invites him to come and make some medicine. But as they leave, another adventurer from the merchant town is spying on them, and he plans to stop them and Patrick from achieving their goal at all costs. Mako takes the alchemist to Patrick, and the poor guy panics as he learns he is going to work for the famous R Company. The butler takes them to the lab, and the alchemist calms down as he feels that he is in his zone among the ingredients and various scientific tools. The process of making the ambrosia medicine is rather simple, and only the extraction of fluid from ruby eyes is a tricky part. The butler says that they were using the ruby eyes as a replacement for real ambrosia flowers because they were hard to find, but the bees fed on the flower, so their eyes could work just fine. And now Mako thinks that if he can get his hands on the ambrosia flowers, he can become really rich quite quickly. The alchemist follows the recipe and the first step is preparation magic. His chant takes too long and Mako finds his methods quite inefficient, so he sneakily interferes with the process and does it more quickly. The first bottle of the medicine is soon made, and the butler takes it to Patrick to feed his wife. After the remaining two doses are made, the alchemist is far too relaxed for his own good, and as the butler barges into the room, he is startled and tosses the bottles in the air. Mako reacts quickly and catches the first bottle easily, but for the second one, he has to use his baseball skills and dive, hoping that any part of his body catches the bottle. He hits his head on the wall in the process, but he gets the job done. Then they run to find that Patrick was in trouble, and that his hand was wounded while feeding medicine to his wife who acted violently and attacked him. The alchemist says that this could be a self-defense mechanism of the curse, and Patrick starts reciting his sob story, and says that he is too scared now. His words get to Mako's heart, and he volunteers to subdue his wife, and even though Patrick says that it will be too difficult for a level 1 man, everyone else trusts that Mako is good enough. He enters the destroyed room and uses the medicine on the ground to lure the woman out. He was not expecting her to be an ugly, bald, frog-like zombie who would attack him out of nowhere, but he easily dodged her first attack. Mako knows judo, so when the zombie woman attacks him again, he takes her down, and while he is holding her, Patrick makes her drink the medicine, and she returns to normal but is still quite ugly without her hair. Next up are the daughters, who are the same bald zombies, and the first one is pretending to be Spider-Man before Mako restrains her, and she is healed. The alchemist comes with the last dose of the medicine and clumsily trips and tosses the medicine in the air again, but the butler catches it like I catch feelings for anime girls. The last patient still has some of her consciousness, and she begs Mako to run away, but he helps in healing her too, and thankfully everything is well now. Patrick thanks the goddess and Mako feels like throwing up when he hears her name. Then our hero goes outside, where his two servant girls are waiting for him, and someone suddenly attacks them using a fire pillar trap. Mako dodges the fire, but Tomo and Mio stay at their place willingly, and the attack has no effect on them at all. The attackers are the same adventurers who were spying on Mako earlier, and Tomo says that these two had been tailing them for some time. They are not alone, and on the leader's clue, 20 more adventurers surround Mako's party, and the leader asks the two girls to come to his side. Tomo recalls that the fool in the last town said the same thing and refuses to even consider his request, but Mio takes up his offer for 10 gold coins. This was Mako's plan as he wanted one of the girls to sit out, as that would cease their jealousy and competition. As the enemies attack, Mako tells Tomo to leave them barely alive, but she is just dodging and asks her master to signal the beginning of the fight formally. Once she gets her desired signal, she takes everyone out just with the back of the sword, and at last the two main culprits, the warrior and the wizard, are left. The wizard panics and betrays his friend by using a teleportation spell, but before he can complete his chanting, Mako goes ahead and plays basketball with his face. Then the main culprit introduces himself as the town's number one adventurer, Lime, as he attacks them. Tomo easily disarms and knocks him down. On the ground, he is terrified, thinking that this is his end, and Tomo reads his memories and realizes that he was not a bad person. 
On her advice, Mako hears Lime out, who apologizes to him and tells the full story of his hatred of Patrick. It began a few months ago when the art trading company was misusing its domination in the market to corner many adventurers into being jobless and some of them were losing their lives trying to complete reckless missions. It was even harming the orphanage where Lime came from and he decided to join hands with a witch doctor who suggested putting a sleeping curse on Patrick's family so that he reconsidered his actions. But the evil witch doctor was lying and he cast the evil curse on the three women that would gradually kill them and Lime says that he had no idea about this. Tono can confirm that he was telling the truth, so Mako lets Lime go and tells him to tend to his allies, but before he can go, Mayo takes more money from him than the agreed amount. Lime then goes to apologize to Patrick, who decides to forgive him out of respect for Mako and since his family is well now, and then Tomo takes him under her wing and tells him to act as her spy and gather information about the art trading company that she does not trust. Meanwhile, in the demiplane, a little problem arises that concerns Meko and his two overpowered servants. Emin explains the situation to the confused Meko. The warriors of the demiplane were losing confidence after training with them and losing to them by huge margins. The discussion for a solution begins and Meko decides to check things out a bit more before saying anything. But since Mayo's spider people were individually strong and doing better than Tomo's lizardmen, they both got into a quarrel and Mako stopped their fight before telling Tomo to talk with her people and taking Mayo with him to learn more about the situation. He goes to check on the orcs and uses his kai to snoop in on them while they talk about farming and training. In their opinion, Mayo and Tomo were still decent teachers because they let them get close and let them take a hit if they tried hard, but Mako was a merciless monster who did not give them even a single opening. He feels quite bad about this, and then Tomo comes and says that the Lizardmen thought exactly the same thing as the Orcs, and both species were training in secret to make sure that the others did not learn about their techniques and strategies, and this is what Mako thinks he needs to change. He suggests that the different species could exchange their strengths, weaknesses, and strategies, and then they should cooperate and grow, and Tomo has an idea to turn this into reality. An arena is quickly created, and the warriors of the Lizardmen and Orcs have been assembled there under Mako's order. Tomo takes the charge of conducting the show, and she says that the strongest warriors of both species will represent their people and fight a duel, and the tiny Tomo clone will be the referee. The battle begins and the lizard warrior uses an air cannon before jumping up and attacking the orc warrior, who uses a shield spell to block his attack and counterattack with powerful blows that crush the arena. Mako is amazed at their level, but Tomo has told him to keep a poker face so that the warriors do not get overconfident. The Lizard Warrior then uses a strong wind blade to slice his enemy, but as he jumps to deliver the finishing blow, the orc catches him by the tail and swings him around before slamming him onto the ground. The referee signals the end of the battle and says that the orcs won. Everyone cheers for the champion for a few seconds, but the mood turns gloomy since Mako is still maintaining his poker face, and then Tomo says that this battle disappointed her. She says that the Lizardmen and orcs were still too weak and hopeless, and they betrayed her expectations. She then scolds them for trying to hide their strategies from each other when they were so weak and says that they should grow stronger through friendly rivalry. With that, she tells them that since it was foolish to compare ordinary warriors to the big three, they will be having weekly battles from now on, and a ranking system will be put in place to decide who is the strongest and eventually all the species will participate in the battle. After the harsh words from Tomo, Mako gives some encouragement to the two warriors, saying that they show great potential. There's nothing much he can say, and then Tomo announces the beginning of Demispace ranking tournaments. The next day, our hero and his girls go to the Adventurer Guild to find that they have an urgent mission since the best adventurer, Lime, retired and many others were injured, but the receptionist does not know that Mako was the cause of all her problems. She just wants Mako to train some strong adventurers to become the future number one candidates, and he thinks of Toe's party immediately. He tells Tomo to train them and she takes it upon herself to make the woman who resembles her master's crush strong enough so that he does not worry about her. Her training is intense and too hard, and at the end of it, she makes them fight a group of strong monsters when they can't even defeat one of that kind. The adventurers are defeated badly and on the verge of being injured when Tomo puts a barrier between them and the monkey monsters, calling them useless and lecturing them on their lousy strategy. She says that they were just charging recklessly at the monsters, but that was not good enough, so she will teach them a new tactic now. First, she asks the alchemist to create a mud trap and put a paralyzing potion in it. And then she asks the elven archer to take a high position. The dwarf warrior would face the monsters head-on while Toa would use her stealth skills to deal a finishing blow from the back. And simple magic like shutting the breathing holes of the monsters with water was enough to kill them, and the adventurers were quite horrified to learn how ferocious Toma was. After that, they follow her training and hunt all the monsters and their boss, they are quite tired and Tomo tells them that they did good. But next time, 
they will have to defeat an entire gang of monkey monsters on their own if they want to become the ace of this town's adventurer guild. And the next tag is not far away as Tomo drops the adventurers near another den of the monsters and tells them to defeat them tomorrow morning. She gives them the night to test and prepare their strategy, and they are not confident that they can do it in their current condition. But despite that, they return after defeating the second group too, and the tales of the two monster bosses are enough proof that they have become one of the strongest parties in the town, and Tomo gives all her students passing marks. Inside the demi-plane, Mako instructs Mio to find the ambrosia flowers, as he plans to use them to make medicine that would be his best-selling item. In the meantime, he goes to town to find a good place to set up shop and asks Patrick to lend him a store in one of the buildings of the art trading company. Patrick tells the butler to make arrangements and then he starts talking with Mako about why he does not want to buy his own shop and just rent one. The reason is simple. Mako has learned from the merchant guild that if a merchant sets up a permanent shop in a country, the country asks them to help with spying tasks. He does not want to do that and wants to get the help of someone who owes him great favors. Patrick knows it all well, and he suggests to Mako that there is a neutral city that does not belong to any kingdom, and if he sets up his store there, there will be no need to spy for any country. He has some connections in the city and Mako is more than happy to accept this favor. Mako has established his own trading company, so the citizens of the Demi Plain are throwing a party for him. Mayo wants more of her master's attention, but Tomo realizes that this day should be about the rest of the citizens and pulls her rival away. Seeing that the two close servants are not near him, other people start approaching Mako. The first one is an out girl who has mastered her human transformation. She looks and talks like a cheerful human girl in her late teens and talks about her visit to the nearby forest to learn about the ambrosia flower. They found a pond with a lot of flowers and the exact location is on the map she hands Mako, but then she adds that there was a demi-human species in the forest that was guarding the flower, so they did not bring anything. Mako also thinks that it is a good idea to be careful and not pick fights with strangers recklessly. Next up is the Lizardman representative who fought the first battle, and he reveals that he was training to be a samurai under Tomo, and Mako thinks that he will surely get infected by her idiot swordsman syndrome. After that, the dwarf who first came to the demi plane tells how jealous he is of the two girls who get to accompany their master outside, but he is still quite happy here. He says that the demi plane was almost endless and had everything they needed, it could be called their paradise. He expresses his interest in selling weapons, and Mako says that he will let him have a corner in the new shop he is opening so he can sell his weapons to humans. Then comes the orc whom Mako once healed in the past, and he says that he is the one who is tasked with guiding humans in the illusory city. And after him, many more citizens want to get closer to their ruler and talk to him. Meanwhile, Mayo and Tomo are in a corner of the forest, and as they are talking about Mako, they feel his presence suddenly disappear and then reappear. This creates a huge panic in their minds and they run to his location, where they find him practicing archery. Mayo was super worried, and she hugs Mecca while crying and he has no idea what he did wrong. Tomo starts scolding him suddenly and asks him what he was doing when he was practicing archery, and after thinking for a while, Mako says that he was focusing too deeply while aiming. That is the cause of their worries because during that deep focus, Mako's consciousness disappears and then reappears after shooting. He does not see anything wrong with it and Mio cries even more, saying that one can only disappear like that when he is dead, and Mako says that since he was alive, it was not a big deal. Tomo scolds him again, saying that there is a serious problem he does not know about. Because of his intense focus, he was disappearing and reappearing, and it was almost the same thing as dying and being reborn. That was causing his magic to increase rapidly, which was an impossible event for most people, and currently, his magic has grown too much to be contained by the five rings he is wearing. Mako is worried now and asks if his aura is leaking like a demon king again, but Tomo says he has already passed that limit a long time ago. Right now his magic is on the same level as the goddess, and because of his growing power, the demi plane is continuously expanding, which will soon cause complications. But that was not even the biggest problem, if the goddess learned about Mako's increasing mana, she would see him as a threat and a challenge to her power, and then she would make her move to kill him. Mako realizes the seriousness of the issue now, and he decides to use Kai to conceal his aura. Tomo says that she will ask the dwarves to prepare more efficient magic-suppressing tools for him. Mayo is still crying and dehydrated because of all those tears, and Mako takes her to her room, while Tomo shivers in excitement about how things are going to play out in the future. The next day, Mako's mental health is in shambles. First, he is tense since he can no longer practice archery, and then Mio tried to sleep with him last night. And today, he had too many permissions to acquire to open a store. He is lost in his thoughts when he finds himself in an alley and dodges a bag thrown in his face. It belonged to a rat-like demi-human, and as Mako helps him, 
he finds out why the people say he looked barely human. Then a girl starts hitting on him, and he realizes that he is in a red light area. But before he can say anything to her, Tomo and Mio appear out of nowhere and drag him to a hotel room. They are angry and saying that if he wants to experience the love of a woman they were here, but he was getting cozy with another woman. The girls corner him, asking if they are not good enough, and they cannot wait any longer and become too aggressive as they tear off his shirt. Mako panics, uses his magic to block them, and then runs away using a mist gate. Mia was anxious that her master will hate her now, but Tomo understands that he was just unnecessarily shy. Mako finds himself hanging upside down from a tree as he teleported himself in a hurry and Emma finds him and by his torn clothes and the pink mist around him, she understands what he just went through. The next day, Mio comes to him as he is watching the new suits that can help him suppress his magic, and she apologizes to him in private. He asks her not to do such things again, and she replies that he will die a virgin at this rate. The mood is awkward and to change it, Mako asks her about the forest where she found the ambrosia flowers and the demi-human species protecting it, and then he asks her to come along with him to talk to them. In the forest, they notice a group of adventurers spying on them, and while Mia wants to finish them off for good, Mako tells her to just trap them in her silk and walk away. Then they find the ambrosia nursery in a pond, and someone is definitely taking good care of it. As Mako takes his step towards the flowers, he is about to slip, and he remembers his past as he asks Mio to hold his hands. She takes the moment and holds his hand as she gets lost in her romantic dreams, hoping it will never end. But then they are interrupted by the two guardians of the lake, two forest ogres or forest oni. The short one is a crazy and goofy wizard named Eris, and the tall one is an aggressive archer called Aqua. Mako tells them that he is here to talk with them, but by his side, Mayo is releasing a demonic aura as she wants to kill the people who disturbed her when she was holding the hand of her man. The greedy adventurers also come to steal the ambrosia flowers, and on the other side, the forest oni are looking quite hostile. With the berserk mode Mio at his side, Mako is left alone to deal with this chaotic situation. The crazy wizard Eris says that Mayo smells like their sacred flower, and after that, she starts attacking Mako and the adventurers with ice spears. He takes Mio and runs away, and as the adventurer woman asks him why he was running and not fighting, he realizes that she was the same woman who was hitting on him in the red light area. Mako counters the ice spears using Kai and seeing that the archer Aqua fires a magical fire arrow that splits into smaller arrows and blasts the small-time adventurers. But Mako can easily deflect those magical arrows with his Kai, and the forest Oni are surprised that he could block both their attacks. He still keeps running from the fire arrows while carrying Mio, but then Tomo calls him telepathically to just be petty and make fun of him. She says she can see everything that is going on but won't help Mako since he treats the spider girl like his favorite and scolds her whenever she talks about samurai culture. He replies that he will let her make katanas and even set up an alcohol factory. And that bribe gets through to the dragon girl, who tells her master the tactics to survive this situation. First, she tells him to create a smokescreen around the other adventurers, and if the forest Oni can't see them, she will suck them into the illusory city with her mist gates. Mako follows her instructions and uses a fireball to create smoke so that Tomo can do her job. Then she tells Mako the trick to calm the spider girl down by feeding her favorite snack, his blood. Mako cuts his hand on a sharp ice spike ball and feeds it to her and she gladly licks all of it and licks her lips, thanking him for the meal. Now that there is nothing holding him back, Mako decides to fight and Eris is the first one to attack. She creates a powerful ice storm to attack the intruders, but Mayo uses her dark magic to consume the spell and the magic, while the forest Oni is still chanting the spell. Impressed by his servant's cunning trick, Mako gives her a flash warning before using a really bright fireball and sings blinding lights by the weak. The forest Oni are left immobile for a few seconds, and using that time, Mako uses his magic to break their wand and bow, and just in case they still have some hidden weapon, he asks Mio to tie them with her strong silk. After holding them hostage, he says that he is just a merchant who came here to talk with them about a business deal and not to simply steal the flowers. The guards can't accept the offer of trade themselves and suggest taking Mako to the village, where the elders could hear him out. So they come to their village, which is hidden in the forest using a magical barrier that feels oddly familiar to Mako. Then he meets the elders of the forest Oni tribe, and they take offense when he asks them if they are elves. They say they are a different species and were actually the ancestors of the regular elves. While the elves relied on the power they received from the spirits, the forest Oni had their own knowledge that they could use to control the forest. Before their discussion about the business can proceed, the chief's son Don comes to the room, and he acts harsh and hostile towards the guests. He even gets into an argument with his father and other elders and calls them cowards and idiots who were still hiding in the village while the dragon's barrier that was keeping them safe was weakening. 
He also doubts that Mako is just a merchant, as he was able to defeat two of their skilled warriors, and then he leaves the room with a subtle yet threatening warning to him. Then Mako's interview with the elders begins, and they take up most of the day. He is mentally exhausted by the evening when he meets Eris and Aqua, who want him to meet their teacher. Mako is too tired to meet any more people, but even as he refuses, the teacher breaks the wall of their room and enters. The cheerfully destructive man introduces himself as Mondo, and like an aggressive extrovert, he intensely shakes hands with Mako and says that he has not felt this good lately. All the girls in the room doubt his gender and Mayo is especially furious that he held her master's hand for one second longer than her. She kicks Mondo out, and as he crashes into the ground, he realizes that neither Mako nor his servant were ordinary humans. His wound heals automatically, and he laughs, saying that they will regret meeting him. Before they can lob out for the night, Mako tells Mio to spy on the forest Oni, especially Don and Mondo, who seem quite suspicious to him. She takes the mission and disappears into the floor and goes to check on the perverted teacher first and finds that he does not even have a scratch from where she hit him. He also has a strong, unnatural earth mana surrounding him and Maya was certain that he is possessed by something and her gluttonous senses tell her that it is going to be delicious. Then she intercepts Don's telepathic message with someone using her webs and finds that he was in contact with demons and together, they were plotting something big. Maya reports everything to Mako, who thanks her for her hard work and then asks her to swap places with Tomo, since he has something to confirm. After that, the forest Oni throw a party for their guest, and as Mako enjoys the party, he sees Don and Mondo discussing something. And then the latter suddenly grabs Don's throat and a strange monster is released from his body. It takes the form of a skeleton monster who absorbs all of Don's life force and kills him by turning him into a husk. Everyone is terrified and Mako confronts the skeleton monster about why he killed the two men and he replies that his old vessel was now useless as he had consumed all of his life force and the other man was collaborating with the demons, whom he did not like. Now the skeleton monster is curious about Mako, who is not terrified of his aura, and he wants to ask him some questions. But our hero already knows a lot about the monster and reveals his backstory. He was a researcher who was very greedy for knowledge, so he did forbidden experiments and achieved an immortal body so that he could study forever. That is basically the definition of a lich Mako had learned from video games, and it impressed the skeleton monster a lot. He calls Mako quite amazing, but is still confident that he will win a battle. He plans to use a powerful attack on him and warns him that if he dodges it, the forest Oni behind him will die. But Mako replies that he was not planning to dodge anything and would take everything like a man. The Lich tries to curse Mako, but he is resistant to any status abnormality because of his vast magic capacity, and then use a poor copy of Mayo's power to use darkness to absorb the attack. Along with that, he consumes all the power of the Lich and defeats him, but does not kill him. As the Lich falls to his knees, Mako says that he will interrogate him later, and then Tomo appears among the crowd and teleports the Lich away using the Mist Gate. The Forest Oni are terrified of Mako's power and consider him a real monster now. The Elders reveal their plan in fear, saying that they wanted to lower his guard during the party and then execute him sneakily. Mako is horrified, but Tomo interrupts the conversation before he can say anything. She recognizes the Chief of the Elves and calls him by his name, but he doesn't remember seeing her. Tomo reminds him of the time when he was young and he practically cried and begged her to create a mist barrier around his village, and the chief immediately realized that she was the great dragon. He bows down to her and tells his shocked villagers to do the same and Mako finds that his guess was right. Then Tomo introduces Mako as her master and tells the forest Oni to bow down to him instead, and they are all stunned and speechless. Then they go back to the demiplane to interrogate the lich and ask him what his goal was. The lich replies that he wanted to become a grant one of the high-ranking humans who were superior to everyone else. Mako is confused, but the Lich has some questions for him about the magic he just used. He replies that it was just a poor copy of Mayo's magic, but it was not quite efficient. The Lich is stunned and says that the trick he just used to defeat him would have taken a huge amount of power, and it was like using a missile to kill an ant, but Mako says he has plenty more where that came from. The Lich is frustrated by the difference in their power levels and he throws a tantrum and raises his voice at Mako, but Mayo and Tomo quickly silence him with a blade pointing towards his neck. What are they going to cut there anyway? Mako calms his servants down and tells them not to harm the Lich as he wants to conduct some business with him. He asks the Lich if he has some magic books. He would like to purchase them as his spell book consists entirely of a single piece of paper given to him by an orc girl and the Lich is absolutely devastated upon learning the real difference between himself and a human. Tomo suggests to Mako that instead of buying a book, he can just keep the entire Lich as his magic instructor. And then she turns to the Lich, asking him that since he wants to become a Grant, 
He must have done enough research to know that there were other worlds in the universe beyond the one controlled by the goddess. Everyone is shocked and Tomo explains that by doing a lot of extensive research, anyone could learn about the Grants, who were the high-ranking humans who could freely travel between different worlds, and Mako suddenly sees the hope of returning to his home world by becoming a Grant. But Tomo quickly crushes his dream and that of the Lich, saying that becoming a Grant was impossible now. A long time ago, some humans found cracks in space and time, and they used those cracks to go to other worlds. But most of them regretted traveling to worlds that were too pathetic compared to this one and returned. Only a few of the travelers decided to stay in the new worlds and remain there to start a new life like Mako's parents. And that is how they became Grants after completing their journey, and they were not superior humans before leaving for the other world. The Lich is devastated as his dream is crushed, but Mako asks if it was possible, at least in theory. Tomo replies that it was indeed possible, but the chances of surviving traveling to another world even with the goddess's permission were only 10%, and that was basically a suicide attempt. The Lich is disheartened and says that he worked down to the bone that there was no benefit to working this hard. Tomo suggests he become Mako's servant since he is also from another world, and together, they may have a chance to find a way to another world, and as compensation, he could be a walking magic spell book and teacher for their powerful master. Mako thinks that Heat and the Lich are quite similar in many respects, and so he accepts to make him a servant using the contract ritual. As they begin the ritual, it soon turns out to be 100% dominated by Mako, and the Lich will be his slave for the rest of his long life. As the contract finalizes, Mako realizes that he did not know if the Lich was a man or a woman because he was just bones. And as it turns into a human, Mako gets a mini scare on seeing the long flowing hair, but the Lich turns out to be a handsome young man who kneels before his new master. As Tomo says that she will coach him on how to be a good servant, she suddenly gets a stroke and feels really ill. And then, a large explosion in the distance rattles the place, and the dragon girl coughs blood as she says that she made a mistake and faints. Mako is worried and he tells Mio to take care of Tomo's bleeding, while he rushes to the site of the explosion along with the Lich who cannot run so well because he is not used to muscles and blood. He offers to stay back and use long-distance healing magic while Mako goes ahead and finds that some of his citizens were injured in the explosion. There were a few orcs who were seriously injured and a child was crying over them. Also, there was an Alk who was completely burned and even his super regenerative abilities were not kicking in to save him. Mako touches his body and finds that he feels cold and lifeless and suddenly the memories of his first pet dying pop up in his mind. He is terrified but the Lich tells him that the Alk was quite seriously injured but he was not dead and now they should both focus on saving his life. Mako uses his healing Kai but it has no effect on the spider person, so in a desperate attempt, he uses another layer of healing Kai on him, and somehow that starts working. The Alk is stable, and the Lich says that he will do the rest, and tells Mako to find out about the explosion. He finds his magic in the air, and then the crying orc child comes to him and says that her dad was at the site of the explosion, and was trying to stop the humans from stealing something. Mako runs and reaches the site of the explosion, finds mist gates opened in the sky, and senses an adventurer on the other side. There are other mist gates too, and they are quite unstable, and he feels the presence of Tomo's clone, the other adventurers, and the orc on the other side. The gates suddenly disappear and the consciousness inside them fades, and Mako realizes that this is what Mayo and Tomo told him about the person's presence disappearing upon death. But one of the adventurers is still alive, and he tries to save her so she can tell him how the explosion happened. As Mako puts his hand inside the mist gate, he sees the memories of the female adventurer that tear his mind apart and give him the headache of his life. He learns that the adventurer was a crafty, cunning, and racist woman who had thrown the bag of the rat demi-human at him to get close to him. And once she was let inside the illusory city, she looked down upon the orcs and decided to steal things instead of receiving gifts. Along with her group, she stole things from a waste disposal facility, thinking that they were precious items, and when the orc child spotted them, they kicked her away. Another orc and an alk tried to stop them for their own safety, but they attacked them and then threw a bag to drive them away. That bag contained one of the rings that had absorbed Mako's power, and it was about to release all the stored energy when Tomo's clone used a water wall to protect everyone. But the explosion was too powerful and killed the clone and other guys in the process and seeing it, Mako's mind shattered. Despite all the damage and deaths, the main culprit is safe because his shield artifact protected her and the explosion created a mist gate that sent her back to town. She is still thinking about the weapons she stole when the mist surrounds her and Mako comes out with a menacing look on his face. The woman insults his looks, but at this point he does not even care and replies that he is thoroughly disappointed in himself because he thought humans could appreciate the hospitality of the demi-humans. 
He says that the woman was the only one who survived even after being the main criminal. And he says that it is unfair that humans are so lucky thanks to the goddess's grace. He tells the girl with murderous eyes that he should have killed her and her group when he first noticed them. The girl is terrified and she draws a sword and Mako takes out his short sword too. She steps back and tells him not to come close, then suddenly attacks him. But Mako slices her hands off and the girl rolls on the floor as she cries in pain. He kicks and curses her, and even as she begs him to spare her life, he says that she killed his people and he was here to deliver justice. He stabs the girl, and as she dies, Mako realizes that he just killed someone deliberately for the first time, and that messes up his brain. He is not certain how it feels, and he cries as he screams and breaks down. The next day, he pretends to be fine and takes part in the funeral of the dead orc and Tomo's clone, which was done in the traditional orc style by lighting a bonfire. Mako blames himself for being so naive and trusting humans, which led to their deaths. After that, he takes his time to name the Lich Shiki, and then talks with Tomo, who is recovering from last night's injuries. He asks her how he could use her innate power and see the memories of the woman, and he wonders if he also shared a part of his servants. This theory terrifies him, and he thinks he is a human-dragon-spider-undead hybrid, but Tomo just laughs at him. His other servants explain that nothing from the servant's body or soul enters the master, and thus he is unchanged. Also, with the strengthening of the emotional bond between the master and his servants, he could use their powers, but it usually takes time to learn. But in some emergencies, the powers of a servant trusted by the master manifest uncontrollably. Mayo is jealous that Mako trusted Tomo more and her power manifested. And as they quarrel about being close to their master, they call Shiki just an extra servant, causing him emotional damage. Then Mako takes a tour of his city and talks with the residents about revising the safety measures by creating a wall between the illusory city and the real settlement. He also learns that the injured Alk is recovering quickly, and he wants the cheerful spider girl to look over the illusory city from now on by acting like a human adventurer. Then he goes to the dwarves, and they have plans to manage the waste more quickly and safely. After that, Mako goes to the family and friends of the dead orc, who was the same one he once healed. And they say that anyone would have given their life for their master, and now our hero has made up his mind about the Demiplane's future. Mako then goes to the town, and Patrick tells him about the Academy City of Rosgard, the neutral city he had mentioned earlier. The businessman shows him the map of their continent, which looks awfully similar to Japan, and the neutral city is quite far away, so he will have to use a teleportation gate. Then Mako tells Patrick that he is planning to leave soon, and that he will let his associates manage to shop here. He thanks the veteran businessman for everything and apologizes, saying that he was lying about the mask and reveals that he just had an ugly face. Patrick is stunned, but he pretends to be fine and says that he is still grateful to Mako for saving his family. But that is just a backhanded compliment, and he compares him to the ugly zombie version of his wife. With everything sorted outside, Mako decides to take Shiki as his companion to the Academy City, since he is a talented researcher, and could help him learn more about this world and its mysteries, as well as about the goddess. Mayo and Tomo are not happy, but he bribes them with recordings of his memories about guns and sword fighting, and asks Mio to take care of the shop, while Tomo will look after the demi-plane. He bids everyone in his city goodbye and leaves for the neutral city with Shiki, using a teleportation gate, but the goddess finds him using it, and then suddenly teleports him elsewhere with a golden beam. His servants can't locate him and they panic, while Mako is in a wasteland and suddenly feels someone approaching him with bloodlust. He reacts too late to dodge the attack of a warrior woman with a huge sword, and she slices his hand. Mako can tell that she is strong and dangerous, and he has no idea about the short dudes standing next to her. Mako is injured and panicking as he calms himself to fight the two attackers, who think that he looks like a demi-human, and they are confused about why the goddess chose someone as ugly as him as her servant. Mako also realizes that this was the goddess's doing after all, and as he tries to contact his servants, no one picks up his telepathic calls. The warrior woman attacks him again, and he uses his defensive Kai to block her attacks and then uses a bowstring to stop the bleeding in his injured hand. Seeing his movement confuses the woman and she asks him if he was not a demi-human but rather a human-based chimera, and our hero feels that is lower than any other insult he ever received. He asks the attackers who they are, and the woman introduces herself as Sophia Bolga, the dragon slayer and the number one adventurer in the kingdom. And her partner is the dragon lancer who was supposed to be dead, but he was helping her by using his power to become her sword. They say that they have sided with the demons in the war, and now all humans are their enemies, no matter how ugly they are. Mako is confused for a while and cannot give any response to the woman, but then he thinks about her saying this was a war, and uses his detection Kai to find that a large demon army was waiting to attack the humans. He realizes this was the battleground of the final war between humans and demons, and he got caught up in it by mistake. 
The attackers think Mako is the goddess's servant who had come here to prevent the demon army from marching ahead. It was their mission to eliminate him. He also realizes that he cannot run away in this situation and gets ready to fight against Sophia and Lancer by changing his coat to agility mode. He summons fireballs in the sky and then shoots a storm of bullets at them. And as they block those attacks, he tries to run away and hide for the time being. He is stopped by crystal walls in his way and crystal spikes pop up under him, and he barely dodges them. On top of that, Sophia and Lancer have perfect coordination, and the former switches positions with the crystals floating in the air to launch an unpredictable surprise attack at Meko, who uses his Kai to block her attack, but just one hit shatters it, and he is getting overpowered by his enemies. Sophia says that he has no technique at all, and his extreme brute strength is the only thing protecting him. She thinks it was the goddess's protection, and to counter it, she puts on a demonic ring that can remove the protection. The ring does its job and Sophia thinks that now Mako is too weak to fight against them, but he replies that he was not even receiving the goddess of protection earlier and Lancer is curious now. He asks him why he descended in the golden beam that was only used by the goddess if he was not her servant and our hero replies that he doesn't know anything and has no reason to fight them. The attackers refuse to hear him out and instead ask him to say his name before he dies. Mako introduces himself as a level 1 merchant and Sophia mocks him, saying that if he was a merchant, she was just a waitress in an inn, but anyway, she will fulfill her mission by killing him. She thinks it will be easy without the Goddess of Grace, but Mako decides to show them his real power and clear their confusion. He smiles as he takes one ring off and his intense aura leaks shocking the attackers. He then uses his strengthening Kai to make his whole body stronger and then releases his hidden magic to release a powerful shockwave and a destructive fire energy pillar. Just by showing his power, he blows the two attackers away, then detects them using his Kai and takes out his trump card, a special arrow made by the dwarves that will always hit its target. Then he summons a fire bow and arrow and shoots a powerful one that flies towards the two attackers, tearing through the smoke and dust. They are ready to defend against the attack, but that is just what they thought. The arrow divides into many smaller pieces in the sky, pierces their shields and overcomes their blocks to blast them away. Next, Mako uses his water arrow and now Lancer has recognized that he was indeed cursed by the goddess, and when they removed it from him, it made him even stronger. Mako shoots the water arrow and Lancer exclaims that water is his strong element too, and he creates a barrier to stop the arrow. But as the two water element attacks collide, he learns that Mako's talent for using water magic is greater than his, and he freezes as a result. Our hero is glad that he finally won, but Sophia attacks him again, and he dodges her first attacks. But then she taunts him and slashes him from a direction he cannot dodge, and he decides to use his arrow to block the attack. The dwarven technology proves to be much superior to the sword that was made from Lancer's powers, and it shatters, leaving the dragon boy screaming in pain. Before Mako can celebrate his victory, Sophia gets behind him and tries to strangle and suffocate him. That Lancer creates crystals in the sky and swaps Sophia with them, taking her higher and higher till she crosses the atmosphere, and then drops Mako from that height while her partner brings her to safety. As he falls, Mako thinks that the crystals in his way are more dangerous than the height, so he uses fireballs to break them. On the ground, Sophia and Lancer are confident that they will win, but then they see the sky glowing like a 4th of July night, and then fireballs rain from the sky, blasting the two attackers, the human and demon armies at once. Mako has reached a height where he can see his enemies, and he uses his final attack to defeat them, he takes off all these rings that are full of stored magic and combines them with the dwarven arrow and water element to create the strongest attack he can manage. And as he shoots it, he focuses too hard and vanishes in midair. The arrow becomes really big, and as it hits the ground the rings break one by one and everyone in their range freezes before a giant water explosion takes place, which then rapidly contracts. The attack had created a crater and the remaining energy turned into water, creating a new lake in which Sophia and Lancer were floating after barely surviving. They think that Mako must have died too, and the girl thinks that if he is not dead, she will kill him herself. Mako wakes up in his bedroom in the Demiplane, surrounded by his two beautiful servants, who are glad to see him fully recovered. Then he tells Tomomo about the Dragon Lancer not dying and instead becoming Sophia's partner and both of them having sided with the demons and attacked him. Shiki suggests that the goddess probably forced Mako to fight the demons by hijacking the teleportation gate and sending him to the battlefield. He agrees and says that he is too unprepared to face the goddess, and thus he wants to go to the academy with Shiki and learn the basics of magic as soon as possible. Tomo and Mio also want to come with him, but he convinces them by saying that they are his trump cards and he must protect them from the goddess. The girls blush upon receiving this compliment and accept his decision, 
urging him to call them when the time for action comes. Then Tomo introduces Meiko to her new tiny clone, which is almost the same as the last one, but has a different hair color. She says that she used one of Meiko's magic rings as a core to create this clone, so she would be stronger and wouldn't dilate the last one. Remembering his time at the previous clone, he gets emotional and decides to name her Como. Tomo seizes this chance and says that since the clone was born from combining their mana, she was like their child and Mayo is as jealous as the dragon girl wanted her to be. Also, Tomo has recruited the forest Oni to become citizens of the Demi Plain, and they are undergoing hard training by fighting against the Lizardmen and Orc champions. On the other side, the Alk girl has taken on the role of hostess of the Illusory City, and she acts like a pretty teenage girl that adventurers find hard to refuse. Mako's store has also finally opened up in the Merchant City, and many humans are fussing about the demi-human employees there. Eren and a dwarf stand in front of the shop, and the latter takes the dagger of a customer without permission and complains that it was in bad shape, then instantly repairs it free of charge and returns it after Mayo checks it once. The man is shocked by the sharpness and cuts his cheek, and then Eris throws a healing potion on him, marketing their wide range of goods. Now the people are crazy for the amazing products being sold at a cheap price, and it draws more customers including former enemies and friends. As Tomo and Lime watch the shop from a distance, Mako mines the shop with Shiki. He had learned about the casualties in his battle with Sophia and Lancer that the goddess forcibly sent him to. He just used his full power to take care of the two enemies but did not realize that the human and demon armies also faced a lot of losses because of that. He has also learned that there are two more humans from Earth here, who were the heroes chosen by the goddess. And after the last battle, people started calling him the third hero. Back in the demiplane, Mekko thinks about his parents and his crush, who cry because of him, and he promises to become a better person. As Emma comes to take him to his farewell party, Mako remembers that everything started when he met her, and he thinks that life in another world was not so bad. But then he sees Mayo and Tomo fighting again and Shiki on the ground, unable to do anything, and takes back what he just said. He thinks that his future is not looking too good at this rate, but he will do his best to learn more about his parents, and then find a way back home.